the book that I write on now is used in the United States and Canada. I went to Dubai last fall and had the opportunity to speak to professors in Dubai. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Where Accountants Go, the Accounting Careers Podcast. I'm Mark Goldman, your host for this show and a CPA myself. Well, for today's episode, we have another professor joining us, but there are several unique twists to her story. Tracy Miller Nobles is joining us, and she's an associate professor at Austin Community College. But Tracy does quite a bit more than simply teach a few classes. We're going to cover her early career as well, of course, but she's been able to take her start in tax and her interest in data analytics, plus her love for teaching, and blossom them into a very full career that involves teaching, of course, but also many other creative projects that help other faculty and students go further in their own endeavors. She's definitely the type of person that likes creative projects, and she's always looking to improve on the status quo. This was a very refreshing and engaging interview. I think you're really going to enjoy this one. If you do enjoy the show, of course, please do share it out. We always love it when we see shares on social media. And I know I've mentioned it a couple times recently, but not too often. We do have a few books out there as well on Amazon. You can find them by searching for my name, Mark Goldman, on Amazon, and they all pop up. Basically, we have one on hiring for accounting positions. We have one on how to get the most out of using a recruiting company, 49 Tips for Working with a Headhunter, and our most popular book, 49 Tips for a Successful Accounting Career, that's really targeted at those individuals early on in their career. If any of those would be beneficial to you, please check them out there on Amazon. And of course, any sharing that you feel like doing is greatly appreciated. Well, with that, let's go ahead and get started with today's show. This really was refreshing. Here's Tracy Miller Nobles. Well, hello, Tracy. Welcome to the show. Hi, Mark. How are you? It's great to talk to you today. Thank you. Same here. I'm doing well. This will be a fun experience. Well, for the audience, we have Tracy Miller Nobles from the Austin area today on the show. And, and actually, I snicker a little bit. We'll discuss this later. She's not in Austin right now. But she's a professor at Austin Community College, but also does many other things as well. We've had several different instructors on this podcast, both in the commercial world and in academia, but I always like to invite those that are doing more than just the typical teaching, those that are, are going outside of that. It's always interesting to hear the different programs they're involved in, whether for themselves and their own careers or for their students to help them develop their careers. It just always makes for a great story. It's interesting to see all the different things we can do when we start with a background in accounting, and Tracy's story is going to be no exception to that. Well, Tracy, before we get into the things you do now, I do want to start at the beginning so we understand how your career progressed. What led you to consider accounting as a possible career choice in the first place? Yeah, that's a great question, Mark. I really had no idea that I wanted to be an accountant. I grew up in a small town in north of Austin, And my dad was a military man and was in the Army for basically all of my childhood. And my mom was a school teacher. And if you had asked me when I was 12 or 16 years old what an accountant did, I probably would have had no clue. I don't even remember knowing a person who was an accountant or a CPA. And so I had no idea that I wanted to be an accountant because I really didn't know what an accountant did or had any experience with anyone who was an accountant. And so initially, I decided that I wanted to do engineering. And the reason why was because I was good in math, I was good in science, and there was a big movement at that time to get more women involved in the engineering career. And so I thought, well, let's give engineering a try. So I'm a Texas A&M University graduate, and off I go to Texas A&M and College Station, and I enroll in my first engineering classes, 
And I'm thinking, well, this is good. It's interesting, kind of. And I was doing well in classes, but it just didn't give me any spark in my life. I wasn't getting very excited about what we were learning. And so I noticed that in the program offerings that they had at the School of Engineering, there was a degree where you could do half business and half engineering classes. Hmm. And I thought, well, that's interesting because I thought I would have a little bit more personal interaction with individuals, but I would still get the quantitative aspect that I really liked with engineering. So one of the first classes that I had to take in that degree was an accounting class. And I probably knew, Mark, within the first week that I was going to change my major. There was just something that clicked for me. There was some sense of, wow, this is really cool. I really like what we're talking about. And as a professor, I say that's like the light bulb moment where you kind of see the spark go off in students. And that's what I had in that classroom. And So I took that class, that very first beginning accounting class. I was successful in it. I changed my major, and that was it. That was how I stumbled into pursuing a degree in accounting when I really grew up without even having any sense of what an accountant did. And my specialty when I took the courses at Texas A&M was taxation. And it's really kind of the same way was I just had a sense of I took an auditing class and I thought, oh, I don't really know if I really like this. And then I took a tax class. I was like, this is really interesting. I could see myself doing this in the future. And so that's the reason why I decided to specialize in the area of taxation. I'll tell you now, though, when I went to school, we didn't have the opportunity to do something like data analytics or really focus on the area of technology and software with the accounting discipline. And if I could do it all over again, if I was young now, that would be something that I would really pursue. And that's kind of where my teaching career has gone. In a sense, I've started teaching a data analytics class at ACC, and I do a lot of development in the curriculum area in that area of data analytics. So that wasn't an option for me when I went to school, but we grow and evolve and have new opportunities even after we get out of school. And so that's something that I'm pursuing now, learning more about that area so that I can teach my students that information. But yeah, Mark, that's how it started for me. It was pure coincidence that I became a CPA. (laughs) That's interesting. I have to tell you, I need to go figure out what the stats are, but of all the podcast guests that started in a different major, Engineering is, I think, the top. And the second one, though, is like pre-med. We've had several guests. Yeah, I don't know why, but um, something about, I guess, the way we think that leads us into that area and then crosses over well into the thought process for accounting, I guess. I'm not sure. Interesting, interesting. Okay. So you knew you liked tax. You went after that degree. How did you get your first professional job? Was it through, you know, a typical internship program or... Did that exist at your school? How did you get that first opportunity? Yeah, it was through a typical internship program. So I was really fortunate to go to school at Texas A&M where they have a really great recruiting program when I went to school there and still today. And so I was in the professional accounting program, which allowed me to get a bachelor's and a master's degree in approximately five years. So it was a combined program. And through that program, there was a real hard expectation, I would say, that the students participated in an internship program. And it was one of the best things that I did. It really gave me a sense of what my future career would look like. It also helped me solidify that this was something that I liked and was interested in and wanted to pursue. And then it helped when I came back into the classroom, I could take the information that I had learned on the internship and I could apply it to my later courses. So I went through the traditional recruiting process. I did an internship 
at Deloitte in Dallas and really, really enjoyed it. Had a great experience. Got an offer from the Dallas office, accepted the offer, went back to school, and I think I had about three semesters or so left at this point in time. And for some reason, got this wild idea that I actually wanted to live in Denver, Colorado. And so I had no sense of, of really whether this was okay or not. And thinking back, it probably did not make the hiring manager's day. But I called the hiring manager up and I said, I know I have an offer for Dallas. I really want to go to Denver. Is there a possibility that I can go to Denver? And looking back on that, I am so fortunate that Deloitte was so responsive to putting people in places where they wanted to be to be successful. They said, you know, let me call the Denver partner up and see if there's an availability. And I got an interview. I went up, interviewed with the partners, and had a transfer offer from the Dallas office to the Denver office. So I actually started my career in Denver, Colorado, working in the tax office from Deloitte. It was a great experience. My students, Mark, they ask me, especially because I have uh, typically tend to have non-traditional students, students who are not of the typical college age, right? They're working adults, and they always say, what's the sense of going to a big public accounting firm versus industry, and what's the pros and cons of those different areas? And the advantage for me of going to a firm like Deloitte was I just learned so much. In a sense, it's like, um, what is the phrase, like drinking from a water hose. You have the opportunity to learn so much about the area that you're doing work in and seeing so many different clients. But it's a lot of work too, right? Working in those big public accounting firms is a lot of work. And so looking for a bit of a change of pace, I transitioned into a smaller accounting firm, a regional accounting firm in northern Colorado, and it was wildly different than, um, than working at Deloitte. When I worked at Deloitte, I had big corporate accounts, tech accounts, manufacturing accounts. When I worked at that regional accounting firm in northern Colorado, I had tattoo artists, farmers, ranchers, <laughs> you know, it was a whole different world. But I really gained a lot from both of those experiences. So I highly recommend an internship to all of my students. And even if it's not a full-time internship, but just getting some experience before they begin to go out into the full-time space, I think it's really beneficial. You're the second person that we've had on the program that got an internship offer and then asked to move it substantially. It always amazes. Yeah, it's actually. I, think, <laughs> I know. You know, I would think I was so young and naive that I just didn't, you know, have any sense of what that really meant. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I think the other one was a little more sneaky. To be perfectly honest, I need to go back and look up who it was. But. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. It, yeah, it just amazes me that they don't say, oh, well, okay, well, thanks. Good luck. and good Yeah, luck I that. know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure, I, as I said, I'm sure I made that hiring manager's day when I was like, you know, <laughs> I really don't want to be here. <laughs> Take us through the transition into teaching, because one of the things that interested me or surprised me, and this is – just my opinion, but it seems like you got into teaching a lot earlier. I mean, you were in the profession a little while, but it was a little while, not for 20 years and then second career. Yeah, that's right. I do think that my pathway into the teaching profession is definitely a little unique, especially when you compare it to a traditional university faculty. So maybe we should start by thinking about and talking about what's the kind of typical differences between a university faculty member and a community college faculty member. So for the majority, most of the university faculty members have a PhD in accounting. Many of them maybe went straight through the academic career, you know, so they did a bachelor's, a master's, and then immediately into a doctorate. 
And then they came immediately into the academy and began teaching as a professor. Some of them, I think, some of them definitely have some working experience. So maybe they worked like I did for a limited number of years and then transitioned into getting a PhD. Or some of them are looking at it as a retirement option. And so I'm sure, Mark, you probably interviewed some individuals who they've had a full career in the accounting world and now are a professor. The community college level, I find that many of the faculty at the community college level, we don't typically have PhDs in accounting. That's pretty rare, actually, to be a community college accounting faculty member and have a PhD in accounting. And so most of us tend to have transitioned into this profession more from having work experience and then coming into the community college setting. So typically to teach at the community college level, faculty need to have a master's degree in accounting and have some years of experience in working in the accounting discipline. And so for me, one of the things that I really recognized when I worked at Deloitte and when I worked at the smaller regional accounting firm was that my favorite parts of the day was when I was teaching other staff about how to do something or when I was asked to hold a continuing education course. And I started to reflect on that, and I thought, you know, I wonder if I could make this my full-time job. I wonder if my full-time job could be teaching others about this profession that I love so much. And so I'll never forget it, Mark. I called my mom up, and remember, I said she was a high school math teacher, actually. And I called her up, and I said, you know, Mom, I said, there's this accounting teacher position at the high school in the town that I lived in at the time. And I said, I think I'm going to apply for that. And I'll never forget my mom said, oh, Tracy, do you really want to be a teacher? (laughs) (laughs) Do you really want to be a teacher? (laughs) I told her, I said, I think I really do. And she said, you'll be poor for the rest of your life. (laughs) That was her next. (laughs) <laughs> you'll be poor for the rest of your oh life. <laughs> and so unbeknownst to me, it was the best move that I had ever made. And, you know, I rarely ever ignore my mom's guidance or advice. But this was the one time where I just knew in my gut that the place that I needed to be was helping people become accountants. And the minute I walked into the classroom, it was like coming home. It was like, this is the right thing for me to be doing. I love accounting. I love the profession. And I love the idea of helping students see that accounting is a rewarding profession to be a part of. So, you know, Mark, I'll tell you, I did apply for that high school position and I did not get the job offer. (laughs) I think that was a positive experience. It was positive, I think, that I didn't get the job offer because quickly there was an offer, there was a posting at the local community college. And so I applied for the position, and I'm pretty sure the only reason I got hired was because I think I was the only candidate who knew anything about taxation. And I think they were looking for a tax professor. And so that's the reason why I got the job. I pretty sure was I was the only candidate who had any experience in taxation because I didn't have any real teaching experience. And so, again, I sort of stumbled into this profession of being a professor. And I taught at the community college level. I taught at the university level. Um, I love teaching at the community college level. I think that we have a greater impact on helping students move from their current position or their current economic social class into a rewarding accounting career. And so I really like teaching at the community college level and have seen some great successes in students transferring from the community college into the university and then going into accounting as a career and it really making a difference in their lives. Hmm. So, and just to be clear, did you start out in Austin? 
were you in Austin by now or still in Colorado? I started teaching in Colorado, yeah. So I taught okay. at a community college, Ames Community College. It's in Greeley, Colorado. And I taught there for about two years. And my husband at the time wanted to move back to Texas. So there was a position that was open at Austin Community College, and I applied for it. And then I've mostly been at ACC since then. Took a little brief stint and taught at the university, and then came back to my home at ACC. Okay. Yeah, I'm just curious. You mentioned having a profound impact on the students and their really their life. And you also talk about preparing them for a four-year degree, bachelor's degree. Do you have any feel for what percentage of students end up pursuing a bachelor's degree? Oh, yeah. It is a small percentage of students. And I always, the first day when I teach intro to accounting, we have all business majors in there, right? And I always have students tell me what their degree is, what they're interested in. If I have a class of 30 or so, I may have one or two accounting majors, maybe, at the most. And my goal is, and I always tell them, I say my goal is at the end of the semester that I will have at least convinced one more of you or more that accounting is the major that you want to do. So that's really, I see that as a big piece of what I do in the introductory accounting course is introduce accounting to students like me, right, who had never ever really had any idea what an accountant did, and then show students why this career is such a rewarding career and how beneficial it can be professionally, how rewarding it can be, the many variety of opportunities that you can get with an accounting degree, and also how financially rewarding an accounting career can be. So that's one of my main goals. But when we start off, I would say less than 1% of the students that are in my class are planning on transferring and into an accounting degree. Wow. Okay. I, I know. You really surprised yeah. me. I thought you were going to say, oh, a third, maybe even I higher. wish. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Wow. Okay. Something else, I'm very ignorant about the academic world, but something else I found interesting about you is I noticed that you write textbooks or have written textbooks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 So I have done quite a lot of curriculum development since I started teaching at the community college and university level. And it has been something that I never expected. Someone, when I started my professor career, if someone had said, do you plan on writing a textbook? I would be like, what? (laughs) A textbook? No way. (laughs) So how it happened was I started using other textbooks, And I would begin to write these emails to the publishers that would say things like, I think that this could be taught in a little different way. Or I think this would be a really great exercise. Or I found an error, right? (laughs) Like there's some issue with what was in your book. And so I started to get involved in the publishing aspect through thinking about how could we have materials that help students be more successful. How could I create materials that would help students understand it in a more clear way and ultimately be successful in the course? And so what started to happen was I started to develop these relationships with the publishers, and they started to ask me if I would be interested in doing work for them. And so it started out on a really consulting basis, They would send me a chapter that the author had written, and they would ask me to go through it and review it and accuracy check it and make suggestions where things were unclear. And I really enjoyed doing that. I thought that that was a really interesting aspect to do as part of my career. And then they started asking me to develop content. So I made Excel spreadsheets that taught students how to use Excel and accounting, I did a whole series of videos where we took the content from the chapters and developed videos that students could watch outside of class. So I started to do all of those types of things, and I thought, what if we put all of this work together that I have done and package it 
for a textbook for students. And so I first had the opportunity to come on to an accounting textbook where the previous author was retiring. And the textbook needed to be energized and revitalized and really brought current to today's needs of the students today. And so we took that textbook, which was used for more procedural accounting, like bookkeeping type courses, paraprofessional accounting courses, and just completely refreshed it and redid it and took something that was stale and a bit outdated and really brought it into the accounting profession today, what students are going to see. And I loved every moment of it. So I did that for quite some time. And then there was a competing textbook from another publisher. And they called me up and they said, we really want you to come work for us. We want you to come and take over our lead accounting textbook that's used internationally. The book that I write on now is used in the United States and Canada. I went to Dubai last fall and had the opportunity to speak to professors in Dubai. Two years ago, I went to China and worked with faculty members who were using our book in China to teach accounting students in China and asked if I was interested in coming over and essentially kind of doing the same thing. They had a book that needed to be refreshed and revitalized and brought current into the current student needs and career and professional needs. So that was a good transition for me. And so I continue to work on that accounting textbook. And as I shared, Mark, what's used internationally and it's given me the opportunity to speak internationally to accounting faculty, to talk about how to develop teaching practices in our classrooms that will help students learn accounting better and go off into the profession more prepared. And never in my wildest thoughts would I have ever thought that I would have the opportunity to go to China and speak to accounting faculty about curriculum that I had developed. So it's been a really unique and interesting experience. And it all became because I saw something that I thought needed to be improved and started to develop resources that I thought would really resonate with students and other faculty. Wow. I'm glad I asked because, honestly, I almost didn't. I thought, well, that's interesting. And I thought, well, I guess other professors do that. And I had no idea the backstory about how you got into it and all the opportunities that it provides to you. Wow. I mean, go to Dubai and China and I know. It's, inc- it's incredible. It's really incredible. I'm actually working on another, this is a new accounting textbook. I'm really excited about this one because the theme for this book is going to be financial literacy. And that's an area where I think we don't do enough of in the university and college settings and K-12 environment either. So that's a real passion of mine is financial literacy. And so this text is going to be designed for students who are not business majors. It'll be, the course is an elective course. The students will take this accounting course. They may be pre-med or they may be health sciences or engineering students or a variety of different majors, but are maybe thinking about owning their own business or have a sense that they need to have some business background. And so this course will teach them the basics of accounting, not the procedural aspects of it, the debits and the credits and all that kind of stuff, but we'll give them a good enough sense so that they could talk to a CPA and ask the right kind of questions. So one of the major themes in that textbook is financial literacy theme, Um, a sense of not only do I have to understand what's happening in my business, but I also have to understand what's happening in my own personal finances and as as they relate to me from a personal perspective. It's interesting that you can take a passion that you have and decide that you're going to weave that into the curriculum in some way. Yes. Wow. And there's still a couple of things I wanted to ask you about. And I, I know we're more than halfway into this. So what is iteachaccounting.com? <laughs> yeah, so I, 
Yeah, I have a website. It's called iteachaccounting.com. And the website is actually a development that came out by working with a colleague, Wendy Teach. She's a faculty member at Kent State University in Ohio. And she and I have developed a lot of curriculum that centers around the area of data analytics. So there's been a big push in the university and college setting to teach more data analytics to accounting students. And, you know, Mark, you heard me mention earlier, if if I could do it over again, that's the specialty that I would get in accounting, would be anything related to data analytics or any kind of technology, because I see that as being a big skill set that can differentiate students from other students in the job market. And so what Wendy and I decided to do was we decided that we were going to create curriculum that was free for faculty and students to use that taught students the basics of data analytics and really geared at the introductory accounting level, so the freshman, sophomore level courses. And so what we've done is we've created this curriculum. Students get an introduction to Excel. Power BI or Tableau, our most common data analytics software. The curriculum is fully turnkey for faculty, so they can take our projects, use them in their courses, and really have no prior knowledge of especially Power BI or data analytics. And then students get a taste of what those softwares have the capability of doing in terms of the business perspective. And our intention is that they'll have a nice positive experience. And so that then they can see, oh, hey, this is what accountants do when they take data and they analyze the accounting information. And this is interesting, and I can see how I should take more classes in this area or develop my skills in this area. So that's the whole intention of that website, iteachaccounting.com, and our co-branded website is accountingisanalytics.com, and that's where we supply all of our resources for all of our data analytics projects. Now, I will tell you that in some sense, the data analytics website has morphed a little bit due to COVID. And the reason why was because when COVID happened in early March, we had faculty members at my school and at other universities that had really never, ever taught online before. Traditional faculty members teaching traditional classroom courses. And imagine, Mark, not having the technology skills to be able to pivot in one week to take an accounting course that you've always taught in the classroom and figure out how to put everything online virtually. And so Wendy Teets and another colleague, Jennifer Canis at University of South Florida, and I, we took that accounting data analytics website and we developed a whole series of webinars for faculty members to teach them how to teach online. So we did everything from how to use Zoom to teach your classes, how to hold online office hours, how to do assessments, exams, and quizzes and stuff online, the basics of I want to write on my computer. What kind of technology do I need to write on my computer? I want to do some recordings of my classes and then post them online. How do I do that? And so the COVID situation has really pivoted some of what we've been doing lately in that instead of developing curriculum for students to use related to technology, we've really been developing curriculum for faculty to learn how to teach in that virtual environment. So really given us the opportunity to reach out to more faculty and help them become better professors in in the virtual space. You're very creative and you get bored easy. I can I do. <laughs> <laughs> My husband says I never rest. That's what he says. I never rest. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Well, I I do end every show with the same three questions, and we better get to those based on the time. But there's one more thing I wanted to ask you about, because when I approached you about this, I thought, 
you're teaching classes at Austin Community College. We're going through COVID. You're probably sitting up there in Austin and tired of Zoom and that kind of thing. And then I find out you're not in Austin, actually. So, <laughs> That's so, right. <laughs> so tell us what you're doing and yeah, yeah, what's yeah, the semester so, going to look like. <laughs> right, yes. So this summer and also this past summer and this fall semester, ACC is mostly online. Some of our courses are in the classroom, things that have a need to be in the classroom, like our welding and automotive and some of the nursing courses. But all of the business department, we're all teaching 100% online. And that looks like what we used to call online, which is a traditional kind of everything's online. Students kind of go on their own self-paced. We call that asynchronous in the academic world. So there's pre-recorded lectures and students watch the lectures and then post questions and do their homework. So I've always taught a variety of courses that way. When we transitioned due to COVID, we now offer these synchronous online courses. And so what that involves is Actually, this evening, I'm going to get online with my students using a webcast software and teach class just like I would do as if we were sitting in the classroom. And so when ACC made the decision that we were going to be in this kind of 100% online environment, and they really didn't want any faculty coming to campus because of the COVID risk, I looked at my husband and I said, I can teach from anywhere. All I have to have is a solid internet connection. And he said, well, isn't that an interesting idea? And so I just let that percolate for a couple days, and then I brought it up again, and I said, you know, we've always wanted to see a couple places like Yellowstone and Grand Tetons and Glacier and Northern Cascades. I said, what do you think about, we have an RV. I said, what do you think about getting in the RV and heading out to a couple of those places? And he said, oh, I think that's a great idea. And so, Mark, that's what we're doing. So I have a full office space set up in our RV. My goal is my colleagues and my students will never know that I'm in a different place each time or every week or every day, that the response that they receive from me is the same as if I would be sitting in my office at Austin Community College. And that's the benefits of this new virtual world, right, is that we can, as long as we have a good solid internet connection, I can teach my accounting class from Missoula, Montana, which is where I'm at right now. And it's been really fun. It's been a fun experience. In the summer, my students quickly figured out that I was no longer in my home office because the background changed. So they really quickly wanted to know, like, where are you? What are you doing? (laughs) So I said, listen, you know, I'm in Yellowstone, or I think we were at the time. And it was so funny because one of my students goes, oh, Professor, I'm in Oregon right now. (laughs) so you know I think Mark we're all over the place these days and to me that's been something that's positive that's come out of the COVID situation is that I think in a sense it's really redefining what the employment space looks like and this idea of where can you do your job at maybe isn't necessarily from the same place every day yes Yeah, there's so many things that in the past we thought, oh, well, no, there's no way that could work. And here we are now, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, a lot of horrible situations with COVID as well, but it's definitely. Yes, absolutely. Um, Yeah. Wow, it's amazing. It's amazing. Well, I do end every show with the same three questions, and so we probably better get to those. But thank you for sharing. I just, Montana, that's an amazing (laughs) I won't tell you what the temperature is right now. I know in Austin right now it's probably well over 100, but I won't tell you what the temperature is right now in Montana. (laughs) Yeah, I'm even further south than that, so, yeah, I'd rather not hear it. (laughs) 
Well, the first question that we usually close the show with is usually the easiest. From a career perspective, what's been your proudest moment? I think from a career perspective, the proudest moment was when I was awarded the J. Michael and Marianne Cook Prize. This is a internationally recognized prize that's given to faculty members who make a substantial contribution to the accounting profession from a teaching perspective. So this award is given to faculty who have done innovative things in their classrooms, have done innovative things to bring students into the accounting profession and to help students be successful in their careers, and who have also contributed to helping and developing the community of professors. And so, Mark, I think you've heard all of those pieces woven through everything that I have talked about today. And so to be recognized by the American Accounting Association as a thought leader in the accounting professorate, that was really, really awesome. Really gave me a sense that not only am I having an impact in, with my students and in my classes, but also helping faculty from across the world become better professors, which just means that students have better experiences and we can build the pipeline into the accounting profession. So that is definitely one of my proudest moments career-wise. Wow. That is special to be recognized in that way, definitely. Well, second question, tell us about a lesson that you learned the hard way. This is sort of the flip side, I guess. But tell us <laughs> about a lesson you learned the hard way. And the more you're willing to share or can share about the situation, the better, because that's how everybody learns from this. Yeah, so what I want to talk about, Mark, is mental health. I have always been a really type A, high-striving personality, very active, very outgoing, very organized, and really, really motivated. About four years ago, I came down with severe anxiety to the point where I developed agoraphobia and could not leave my house. Oh. And we did a lot of medical consultations and had everything checked out because it really came on. That, in a sense, I felt out of nowhere, which is kind of like overnight. Looking back on it, I now realize that it was probably definitely more progressive than that. But it was probably the hardest life experience I've ever gone through, taking someone who loves to be in front of people, loves to talk to people, loves to travel, and then not even being able to walk outside my house without having panic attacks was really, really detrimental to me. And it was very, very hard. I don't think we talk enough about mental health in the profession or in society. And what I quickly realized was that I needed a whole team of people to help me figure out how I could get my life back to as the way it used to be. And that involved going and talking to a therapist and talking to my doctor and having a good community of colleagues and friends who supported me and recognized and being willing to be open with them without having any kind of concern that they would, I think a lot of times we have mental health and we don't want people to think that we're lesser or there's a problem with us or we have some issue. And so I really struggled with that. I struggled with sharing my story with my friends and my colleagues. I struggled with finding the right medical team and the right counseling support. And then I also had to figure out the right tools for me. So for me, the solution was meditation, yoga, realistic expectations and scheduling and time management, taking a break from my life and my job and my career, 
work-life balance was recentering. My work-life balance was important. And it's something that I have to stay on top of still today because it doesn't, that anxiety that I had and that severe panic and it doesn't ever really go away, right? It's just something that's managed. So that I think for me has been the hardest thing that I've ever gone through. But I also feel that I am such a stronger person today because of it. And so I make a point of telling people this story because I want people to know that mental health is something that we all can experience and that there's people out there that can help you and people that will listen to you and understand the situation that you're in. And there is a way out of that anxiety, that crippling anxiety. So for me, that's been the lesson that I've learned is that I can walk through that with a great support system. Thank you for sharing that because our profession attracts a lot of high achievers. And so we know you're not <laughs> that that's not actually not that unique a situation. It happens. Yeah. You're right. People won't talk about it and and then that makes the situation worse. So wow, thank you. So that's gonna make a difference for some listener somewhere for sure. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Well last question and then we'll go ahead and close it down. What's the best piece of advice that you've ever received? The best piece of advice I ever received was when I was really early on in my teaching career. And while I think this has a teaching perspective to it, I think it can apply to anyone, no matter what their career be. So, you know, I had just come back from a conference and there was all these great ideas, all these things that I wanted to do. And I thought, you know, oh, I want to do that. And I want to do this. And I want to do that. And I was almost marked paralyzed from being overwhelmed about all the things that I was interested in doing and all the changes that I wanted to put into place. And I had a great colleague and a mentor at that time, Susan Crossan is her name. And she said to me, she said, Tracy, she said, here's the thing. You pick one thing and you do it really well. And then when you get that done and you've done it really well, you move on to the next thing and you do that really well. She said, if you try to do everything, you're not going to do it really well and you're going to get frustrated and you won't be successful. And so that's the way that I've tried to live my career, too, is to decide how many hours do I have in the day and what's the thing that I want to, what's one new thing that I want to focus on for the next couple of months, six months, nine months, 12 months. And I'm going to focus on that, and that's going to be the passion and the time and energy that I put into. Of course, not letting all the other balls fall, But what one new thing can I invest in myself and in my career, as opposed to feeling like I have to do it all right now? What's the one thing I want to focus on now and be really successful in so that when I'm successful in that, I can move on to the next thing? So that's the best piece of advice I've ever received. That is great advice. I hope the listeners benefit from that. But that one's for me. I I start every day with the checklist that's way too big, and there's just no way to get to everything. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Got to pare that checklist down. (laughs) Yes, yes. Big projects, you know. It's just just crazy. It's crazy. Oh, my gosh. My gosh. Thank you so much again, because this really has been a great conversation. Your story had a lot more going on than I realized when I invited you. This really has been beneficial, and and I've had fun with the conversation. If someone wants to find out more about the data analytics curriculum, or maybe contact you, where would you want them specifically to look online? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We'd be happy to talk to anybody about the data analytics curriculum. If they're interested in looking at kind of what the curriculum that we have available for faculty and also for students to utilize, the best place to go is either iteachaccounting.com or you can also look at accountingisanalytics.com. 
You're also welcome to reach out to me. You can find my email address on the Austin Community College website. Happy to have anybody reach out to me, and I can provide you with some more resources and universities and colleges, maybe in your area, that are specializing in the area of data analytics. Wonderful. Well, hey, thank you again for taking time out of your glorious travel schedule to record this. Hey, thanks, Mark. It's been so much fun. I really enjoyed talking to you today. Well, that was my interview with Tracy Miller Nobles. And like I mentioned in the intro, that was just a very fun and refreshing interview to do. I had no idea she was in Montana when I first contacted her. And so that was just a unique twist. And then she has so many things going on. And you can tell that she's truly passionate about helping others learn. And so that's just, there again, a a very refreshing and positive outlook. And it just made me feel better after the interview. I really enjoyed this one as well. I hope you got a lot out of it also. Like I always mention, if there's anything I can do for you personally in your own career, please reach out to me. You can find me on LinkedIn very easily. Just look for Mark Goldman CPA. I'm always happy to help in any way that I can. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and close it out for this week. This has been Where Accountants Go, the Accounting Careers Podcast. And as I always say, there's more to come.